subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello everybody, welcome back to Junior High School on Joy Learning. And today, like I always say, my name is your science. My, my name is Opoku, actually. <laughs> Opoku Nyakon is my name. And we are going to talk about another section of something. But don't look anywhere. Just look on the red um, writings. I said I don't look anywhere. I don't want you to have clues. Before we start, we'll have to actually go to talk about the question that I gave you the last time. So let's go straight to the questions. Get the answers right. And then if you had it right, thumbs up, boy. Good. If you did not, don't worry. I am forever here for you. I have to help you to make it in life. All right. The first question that I asked you or I gave you was what is is an ecosystem. An ecosystem is defined as a stable interaction unit between plants and animals. So an ecosystem is defined as the stable interaction unit that exists between plant and animals. It can also be defined as the community of plant and animals living together. So when you have one community of plant and animals, then an ecosystem is formed or built. Number two, what are the components of an ecosystem? What do we have to form an ecosystem? If we know that the ecosystem is a stable unit that helps plants and animals to interact, then we know there are plants present, there are animals present. Aside these, what are they? What again are present? We have animals, we have plants, like I just said. We have water, we have soil, and then we have soil organisms. So animals, plants, water, soil, and then soil organisms. Number three, what are the three major interactions between living in an ecosystem? Or the three main interactions that goes on in an ecosystem? What, what, what happens? I mean, we know that they must interact, but what are the three main themes under which we can classify these interactions between these uh, living organisms or plants and animals in an ecosystem. We may have one as mutualism, number two is commensalism, and then we have parasitism. These are the three main or major interactions that exist between living organisms in every ecosystem. So we go to what is called mutualism. Mutualism is just like you have a friend, okay, and your friend helps you when you are in trouble. Uh, you also fix your friend up or help him or her when your friend is also in trouble. What about that? This is an interaction between two or more living organisms of different species where each organism benefits from the association. So there's nobody losing out. Everybody's benefiting in the association. So in friendship, you have your friend, he benefits from you, you also benefit from him or her. Now, I gave you two different examples of a bird that is busily sucking the nectar from a flower. And then the other one is a butterfly that's also doing the same. Here, the bird and the butterfly are all considered to be agents of pollination because they transfer pollen from the plants to other areas so that we may have diversities or different species of the same plant or that same plant itself actually happening or growing up in other different areas that is far from the parent plant so as these butterfly and then the bird suck the nectar they accidentally carry pollen on them and they may transfer it into other areas Commensalism, the second one, is also another interaction between living organisms whereby one species benefits from the association and the other neither benefits or is harmed. So, one of the two bodies, or the two bodies I'm talking about, those that actually come to form the interactions or that form the interaction. 
if you have two bodies or two individuals forming or going into a relationship, actually, whereby one benefits, the other is not harmed or do not get any benefit, then it's termed as commensalism. An example of it is the whale and the fishes. The whale gives the fishes a very nice swim, okay? And because the whale is so big a fish, the other living organism that would want to or that are likely to feed on this fishes will not come because of the presence of the whale. That is commensalism. So the fishes benefit from the whale, but the whale doesn't get anything. Neither do these fishes hurt or harm the whale. Parasitism is the third one, and then this is a symbiosis relationship between two living organisms whereby one organism, that is a parasite, causes harm to the other, which is the host, which the parasite utilizes as a habitat. So any parasite will come and depend on you, and the main purpose of that is because it is getting something from you. And as that thing is obtained from you, it also causes harm or damage to you. So the parasite is the other organism or species of organism that is living on you to benefit. And you are serving as the host of or for that parasite. An example is the lies we have in people's hair. When a lie or when a, a louse gets into your hair, they reproduce, they double in number, they quadruple before you realize they spread through your entire hair. And as they get there, they also get nourishment from your skin. So they cause dandruffs and your hair to um, fall off and other things. Before you realize, you are, you are actually losing almost every inch of your hair. And then why do we say a pond is also a, sustain, a self-sustaining unit of an ecosystem? Why is a pond a self-sustaining unit of an ecosystem? A pond is considered to be a self-sustaining unit of an ecosystem because it is a natural place of biotic and abiotic factors within that ecosystem to interact among themselves so that they can all live together. So when we say a pond, then you're talking about the biotic factors that we will, we'll talk about now, abiotic factors that we will also know that will all interact among themselves in the ecosystem so that living organisms can live peacefully in that ecosystem. So today we are going to talk about the ecosystem too. We had the first one where we had to talk about why the pond is sustaining, it's a sustaining unit, what's an ecosystem, and then all that. We're going to a different ball game all together. Before we go that, let's go into knowing what are our objectives. By the end of the strand, which is today's lesson, the learner will be able to, one, explain the flowing terms. One, biotic factors of the ecosystem. When we say something is biotic, what does that mean? And then we have the abiotic factors of the ecosystem as number B. Number two is identify and list the components of the biotic and abiotic systems of an ecosystem. Number three is you group ecosystems into terrestrial ecosystem, aquatic ecosystem, and then a boreal ecosystem. Number four, you bring out differences that exist between organisms that are found in different ecosystems. For example, terrestrial, aquatic, ebola. What do you have as differences between organisms that live there? What makes them adaptable to be able to live there? We'll talk about that. Don't go any far. Just go into your school parks, get your books, and then get seated before we start. Number five, you have to explain how the function of the components of each affects the other within the ecosystem. So in the ecosystem, we have the biotic and the biotic. How do these affect each other within the same community or ecosystem where they find themselves? Let's get the ball rolling. Are you back with your books? I guess you are. 
biotic factors of the ecosystem. What are they? Biotic factors are the living organisms or living things that are found in an ecosystem. Biology is the study of plants and animals. So biotic factors of an ecosystem deals with living organisms or living things that are present in an ecosystem. And we have examples as people. We may have plants, animals, fungi, and bacteria. All these are living organisms that are present in an ecosystem. So here, we have biotic factors are the living components of an ecosystem and the activities. So we have a tree as a plant. We may have um, a giraffe here. We have a tiger. We have mushrooms, a bird, a dolphin, a termite, and a snake. And other different plants you have here. All these are constituting the biotic factors of an ecosystem. Because all these are living organisms or living things. Then what are the abiotic factors of the ecosystem? These are the non-living organisms or living things that are present in an ecosystem. So the biotic ones are what you see, what actually breathes, what goes to what is called life processes, like feeding, uh, excretion, reproduction, and all uh, locomotion, which is movement and the rest. Abiotic factors are the non-living parts of an ecosystem and they include the soil the water weather and temperature the soil water weather and temperature in other books you may see soil water and elements of weather that can be temperature that can be sunlight that can be the pressure of the atmosphere that can be wind that can be humidity all these are the component because these are non-living factors within an ecosystem. And they attempt to be the abiotic factors of an ecosystem. And these are the water that I just spoke about, the wind, the sunlight, soil, and then temperature. Atmosphere is also here. So it measures the, the pressure of the atmosphere. All these are the abiotic factors. How many groups of ecosystems do we have? Let's talk about them. We have so many groups of ecosystems. Now, there are different groups of an ecosystem based on laid down criteria. What criteria are you using to classify ecosystems as A or B? Is it by where they are located? Is it by what kind of organisms are present? Is it by what kind of abiotic factors are also present there? So these are different teams under which we can group ecosystems. The groups of ecosystem in this category is dependent on the location of that ecosystem. So here we are going to talk about where lies the different ecosystems that we have. So here, we only really have many. We have only three different ecosystems. And then these three ecosystems are the terrestrial ecosystem, the aquatic ecosystem, and then the ebola ecosystem. Based on location, we have terrestrial ecosystem, aquatic ecosystem, and then the ebola ecosystem. What then is a terrestrial ecosystem? Terrestrial ecosystem is a type of ecosystem which is a land-based community of organisms and the interactions that exist between both biotic and abiotic factors in a given area. So when you have biotic factors, abiotic factors, all located in a land-based community where they interact in a given area, then you're talking about a terrestrial ecosystem. Examples of such ecosystem include tundra. Yes, I know there's a car called tundra. But this is a tundra ecosystem. We also have the Tagus ecosystem, temperate deciduous forest, tropical rainforest, grassland, and desert. And all these are sub ecosystems that are located under the big one, which is called the terrestrial ecosystem. Tundra ecosystem, what are they? 
They are the treeless regions found in Arctic and the tops of mountains where the climate is cold and windy and rainfall is scant. Rainfall is scant. It means that there's rainfall, but the level of or the amount of rainfall there is inadequate. It can't supplement or support their life. So then, if the tundra ecosystem is areas where they are treeless or there's no tree, the conditions there are just so bad to the point that the weather is so cold, the winds are blowing heavily, and then rainfall is in small amount, then let's try to talk on how many, what are some of the biotic factors of this ecosystem? We know that it's treeless, so we don't have trees. Okay. What kind of living organisms are present in these areas? We have this that have been well formed in their own way to be able to adapt to the cold, the wind, and the level of minimal amount of rain. So you may have the wild yak, the snow leopard, the tundra swan, the big, big horn sheep, American pika, and the rest. So all these animals are present in the tundra ecosystem. And per their own physique, you can see that their whole bodies are just immune to the cold, the wind, and then the scantity or the inadequacy of rain present. Tiger or tiger ecosystem is a forest of the cold sabbatic region. So the cold sabbatic region. Now the first one has to do with Arctic region. So they are located on the poles. You know, when you draw or when the structure of the earth is drawn as a gear or a sphere. Remember the egg, the, the earth is not as round as an egg. Okay? It's more or less not as an orange. Sorry, the, the earth is not as round as an, as an orange. It's more like an egg, spherical. An orange is not spherical. An orange is not, but an egg is. So the tundra ecosystem are found at the poles where there's so much cold, so much of the other weather conditions that are not prevalent here, like the snow and other very cold conditions of the weather. The sabbatic of the tiger ecosystem is an area of the northern hemisphere that lies just south of the Arctic Circle, so that is just beneath the, the tundra ecosystem. The taiga lies between the tundra to the north and temperate forest to the south. And this is how they are. The difference between the taiga ecosystem and the tundra ecosystem is the presence of trees in the taiga ecosystem. We learned that in the tundra ecosystem, it's just a treeless community. Does it mean that there's just absence of trees? But trees are just in minimal quantity, just as you have in the forest. You, does it? You may have one here. You may have to drive or walk kilometers or miles before you see another one. And it's not like any blossoming tree, actually. It's just some stunted grove tree somewhere that are not actually getting all the nutrients it, it needs to actually blossom or grow. Then let's go to the aquatic ecosystem, which is another main ecosystem. The taiga, the tundra are all under terrestrial because they are land-based. They are found on the land or they are found, yeah, on the earth's surface. Okay. Now let's go to the aquatic. The aquatic is a water-based environment wherein living organisms interact with both physical and chemical features of the environment. You know what physical features of the environment are. I know you know. Chemical ones you know as the gases, the carbon or the oxygen and all that. Examples of these ecosystems include the oceans, the rivers, the lakes, the marines, and then the rest. An aquatic ecosystem includes freshwater habitats like lakes, ponds, rivers, oceans, streams, wetlands, swamps and the rest now they are called fresh water because the water there is fresh and complete absence of any form of salinity no salt 
Marine habitats, on the other hand, include oceans, intertidal zone, reefs, seabed, and so on. The main types of aquatic ecosystem are marine coastal ecosystem, marine surface ecosystem, lentic ecosystem that are actually the rivers, low tick or low tick ecosystem that are also the lakes. You may have the wetlands and then as the swampy areas. All these are also the other sub aquatic ecosystems. Now, this is a very nice picture of what happens in an aquatic ecosystem where we have different variety or different species of fishes and other living organisms and plants interacting among themselves. So with the biotic and then the abiotic factors all having a nice community of interaction among themselves within that ecosystem. The classification of aquatic ecosystem can be divided based on the nature of the water. So if you want to classify an aquatic ecosystem, you should not forget the fact that it is based on certain nature, and that is the nature of the water. Here we may have fresh water ecosystem and then salt water ecosystem because some fishes can live in rivers and lakes, but not in the seas due to the presence of salt. Let's go to Ebora ecosystem. The term Ebora relates to a tree. For example, Ebora animal is an animal that moves about or lives in trees. You can have examples of these animals, like the birds, the woodpeckers, the um, monkeys, or yeah, the, mon the kingdom of monkeys, and the other funny microorganisms that may be in the roots or in the soil underneath the plants. The animals have sharp claws to climb and climb up and down the branches and usually have strong muscular limbs and a tail for holding onto the branches. That's how they are created. So they have certain features that make them to be able to live comfortably in areas like that. Just as with the tundra, we have uh, animals like the big horn sheep with a thick skin to be able to actually uh, live within the cold, windy, and then uh, inadequate water or rain in that ecosystem. The Ebora habitat can include the roots, the canopies of rainforest, whereby two different plants grow up, they blossom, they flourish, and then their leaves now join each other. So that a more of like a cave underneath, you can just drive or walk underneath. Then you are forming what is called a rainforest, canopy of rainforest, just as we have in the Kakum National Park and the rest. The branches of deciduous and coniferous trees, the leaves of trees, and even holes within the trees. In fact, wherever there are trees, there is a likelihood an organism filling the Ebola habitat. Every tree has an odor. And I, I'm going to say odor, I'm talking about living organisms that live in these trees can be on the leaves, on the branches, even in the roots. Some even peck holes into the wood and they live there. That is the woodpeckers, that bird called woodpecker. Examples of arboreal animals include koalas, woodpeckers, sloths, squirrel, and countless other species. So you may have koalas, woodpeckers, sloths, squirrel, and then the monkeys, the termite, the ant, anything that lives in the root, on the leaves, in the plant itself, is called a boral animal. So we have different kinds of organisms here. The last one here, where you have a hole in a dugout tree, is the woodpecker. They just create holes and then they live in there. And then you have an eagle that has laid its, or hatch, hatch uh, its eggs. We have the almighty tiger resting on a tree. Because they have claws and they have tails, they are also able to climb and then descend trees. And then we have another species of monkey that are all in the Ebora habitat. What are the differences in organisms in different ecosystems? 
Let's go on. The organisms of a food chain vary according to ecosystems. Every organism in any ecosystem is different from the other because of the food chain. The food chain shows how living organisms feed among themselves or within the ecosystem. So you have producers, you have first class or say consumers, okay, whereby you have producers that actually produce food. We may have what is called the primary consumers. We may have the secondary consumers and I also have the tertiary consumers. The primary producers are basically plants because plants are able to produce their own food using light and other soil factors that are available around them to produce, the, prepare their own food and blossom, produce fruits, produce nuts, produce roots and other things that will be useful for animals as well as human beings. For example, the organisms of a tropical ecosystem and an Arctic ecosystem are different. Tropical ecosystem is the area where the sun is so scorchy and the Arctic's are in the cold, windy, and the scant areas of rain. The interactions between these organisms enable the cyclic flow of energy and nutrients in an ecosystem. So the plant will be fed by herbivores. Then the carnivores will also feed on the herbivores. And then the omnivores will also feed on the carnivores. So that is the food chain. Producers in every ecosystem are the basis of food chain and as the name suggests, they are responsible for the production of food and oxygen in an ecosystem. Yes, so far as these producers are able to produce plants or they produce fruits, plants also produce or give us oxygen. So in a way, they give us the food as producers and oxygen is also given as well. Autotrophic plants. Plankton, algae, and certain bacterial species are the main producers on Earth's ecosystem. That's very true. All these are plants that are responsible. Except bacteria, bacteria you have some, some bacteria that are actually plants that are responsible for the production of food. While cyto, phytoplankton are the main producers in the aquatic ecosystem, Autotrophic plants also does same function in the terrestrial ecosystem. Bacteria that are found at volcanic places near volcanic vents also use sulfur to produce food. Herbivores feed on plants, absolutely. Carnivores feed on herbivores. Microorganisms and fungi feed on dead animals and plants. The difference that exists between the producers and then the other ones is that they feed of these living organisms determine which ecosystem they belong. So if a plant is supposed to produce seeds and fruit and leaves to feed the herbivores, which are the primary consumers, so that the primary consumers will also be used of being fed on by secondary consumers and like that, that will actually determine what kind of ecosystem that will be. Because we have certain kinds of trees that are found in water bodies that also absorb sunlight to produce their food. And these plants in water bodies are also being fed upon by some of these living organisms in there so that food will be maintained. So that these living organisms are, will also be fed on by other things and it goes on and on and on like that. How the functions of components affect other factors within the ecosystem. How the functions of components within an ecosystem affect another factors that exist within the same ecosystem. Interactions in an ecosystem result in the flow of energy through biotic and abiotic factors or components within an ecosystem. This energy flow is given back to the abiotic components of the ecosystem when the biotic one fade away or they die. Plants and algae absorb the essential vitamins and minerals they need to live in their environment. Animals eat plants and algae and absorb these vitamins and minerals as well. 
predators eat other animals and obtain the energy and nutrient from them. Predators are animals that feed on other animals. So they are called carnivorous animals or carnivores. They have the, have you gotten it? That with the types of teeth, they have the canines to be able to be tearing flesh into their mouth. This is how nutrients cycle from the abiotic to the biotic world. The living things in an ecosystem are independent. They always depend on each other. You can't just say that um, they are independent. I mean, they are just self-reliant. I mean, they are okay. But with that, even though you are independent, like you are, yes, I mean, you are also somebody of yourself. You must rely on something to be able to be able to survive. This means that the living things, which are the biotic factors, depend on their interactions with each other and non-living things, which are the abiotic factors. For survival, absolutely. A typical example is a tree depends on sunlight and other factors to prepare food, to gain nutrients so that the plant can flourish for herbivores to feed. This also allows food for other organisms that are carnivores and even omnivores that are human beings. We eat both herbs or herbivores and then carnivores. Now let's go to our assessment. Before we do that, let's do a quick recap of what we did today. Today, we had to discuss the various factors of every ecosystem. And the various factors are the biotic and then the abiotic component. When we say biotic component, talking about any living organism or living thing that exists in an ecosystem. So when you have any living organism or living thing there that are plants, animals, they are called the biotic factors. And then in the same way, here we may have trees, we may have mushroom, we see termite, a snake, a dolphin, a tiger, a giraffe, a cactus plant, and other plants that I can't really identify because of the way they've been made. Now all these form the biotic factors of the ecosystem. Now we go to the abiotic factors of an ecosystem, which are also the non-living things or components in an ecosystem. That can be the sunshine, the temperature, the wind, and other essential components or factors like water, like soil, and other ones, if there are any, though. So those are also the abiotic factors, which are not um, living. You don't have life. You don't go to what is called life processes within them. So that's, that's what I have displayed here for you to see. Now let's go to the groups of ecosystems that we have. An ecosystem is based on a particular criteria to define what kind of ecosystem is being dealt or spoken about. So you may use location. That's what we are doing today. And with location of where these ecosystems are, you're talking about the terrestrial ecosystem, the aquatic ecosystem, and of course, the Ebola ecosystem. As the name implies, terrestrial ecosystems are ecosystems that are land-based communities, whereby biotic and abiotic components or factors interact among themselves so that they can successfully live within the ecosystem. We also have the aquatic ecosystem whereby it's just water base, like the rivers, the lakes, the marines, the oceans, and other water bodies that allow certain living organisms to be able to live in there with other abiotic factors so that the interactions can go on for their own survival. Now, when we were on the terrestrial ecosystem, we spoke about certain underlying ecosystems underneath or under this terrestrial ecosystem. That is the tundra ecosystem, the taiga ecosystem, the deciduous rainforest, the desert, and then the rest. We said that the tundra ecosystems are actually found in areas where the weather conditions are so cold, so windy, and then rainfall is in short supply. It hardly rains there. And some of the animals that were displayed or shown to you 
that are known to actually be in this Tundra ecosystems are what I've displayed on your screens. You may have the Stuart, you may have the bald eagle, an eagle with a bald head actually, the American Pika, the Kistrap Penguin, the Elk, the Red Fox, the Widow Seal, and then the rest. Now all these have bodies that are made to be able to adapt or live in the, that kind of conditions. The Tega ecosystem is just located under or it just falls under the Tundra ecosystem. So the difference between the Tundra and the Tega is that they all have the same other conditions. Just that with the Tundra, there's no tree, absence of trees. Or you may even walk kilometers of miles before you may see a stunted growth tree somewhere that is actually lacking so much nutrients so it's not actually growing well because of the bad weather conditions. With the taiga, the, it lies between the tundra to the north and temperate forest to the south. And that is also this, where it's found in mountainous areas of wind, scant, scant uh, water or water supply, and then cold weather conditions. But this presence of trees with the, tie, with the tundra, complete absence or inadequate trees. We go to the aquatic ecosystem that spoke about water-based ecosystem, where we have living organisms as fishes, as whales, as dolphins, as um, uh, sea fishes, as coral reefs, and other plants that are made to be able to live in those ecosystems. We have examples of these ecosystems as the aquatic, as the oceans, the rivers, the lakes, and the rest. An aquatic ecosystem we did mention includes freshwater habitat like the lakes, the ponds, the rivers, the oceans, the streams, the wetland, the swamps, and then other areas. Marine habitat, on the other hand, include oceans, the tidal zone, reefs, seabed, and so on. The main types of aquatic ecosystem include the marine coastal ecosystem, marine surface ecosystem, the lentic ecosystem, the lotic ecosystem, and then the wetlands. These are also found as the aquatic ecosystems. Now we have two different pictures here, one showing different colors of plants, and then different species of fishes and organisms in there. The other also depicting same. So you see yellowish colored fishes, gray, green, purple colored fishes, and then all variety of fishes of different colors in the aquatic terrain or ecosystem. The classification of aquatic ecosystem can be divided based on the nature of the water. Here we may have freshwater ecosystem and then salt water ecosystem. Now we go to the Ebora, whereby it is in the air. What are some of the organisms that live in the air? The term Ebora relates to a tree. For example, Ebora animal is any animal that lives about or moves in trees. The animals have sharp claws to climb up and down their ecosystem and they also have strong and muscular limbs and tail for holding onto trees in case they are just falling off. The Bora habitat can include the roots of plants, the canopies of rainforest, the branches of deciduous and coniferous trees, the leaves of trees and even holes that are made within the trees. In fact, Wherever there is the presence of trees, there is the likelihood that you have an abora habitat of an animal present. Now, examples of animals that are found in the abora habitat include the koalas, the stuarts, the squirrels, the woodpeckers, and no, did I say stuart? No, stuart is not actually. Stuart actually is found in the tundra or tundric ecosystems. So we have the koalas, the woodpeckers, the sloths, the squirrel, and then countless species like the monkeys, bears of all calibers, 
and then all that. So I've given you a picture of a wood pecker that will just, just poke holes into the, the tree until a hole is created for it to use as its habitat. An eagle that has also hatched its chicks. We have a tiger resting peacefully on a tree and then a different variety or species of monkey with a beautiful color on tree. Species or differences in organisms in the different ecosystems. So what are these organisms? Why are they different in every ecosystem? The organisms are different in ecosystems because of their food chain. And the food chain, I'm talking about what they feed or what they are fed with. Good. So the organisms of a food chain may vary according to ecosystems. For example, the organisms of tropical ecosystem may not be the same as the organisms of an Arctic ecosystem. The interactions between these organisms enable the cyclic flow of energy and nutrients in or within that ecosystem. Producers in every ecosystem are the basis of food chain. They produce food for herbivores so that herbivores can now also get food to eat. Carnivores will feed on the herbivores and then if they are omnivores, omnivores will also feed on the carnivores actually. And we know that in as much as plants are preparing or making food for themselves as producers, they also produce or give out oxygen for us to be able to use them. We have autotrophic plants, phytoplankton, algae, and certain bacterial species are the main producers on Earth ecosystem. That are very true. Now, autotrophic plants, they are plants, so they can produce their own food as producers. Cytoplankton are also the same, algae same, and then certain bacteria. While phytoplankton are the main producers in an aquatic ecosystem, autotrophic plants also do the same in terrestrial because they have different adaptability, different adaptabilities uh, into the areas at which they find themselves. They are able to adapt into the conditions at where they find themselves. Bacteria are found at volcanic places near volcanic vents. They also use sulfur to produce what is called food. That's what they feed on. Herbivores, like I said, feed on plants and all that is done already. Differences in the producers' feed of these living organisms determine which ecosystem they belong to, as I've already explained or discussed. How do the functions of components within an ecosystem affect other things within the ecosystem? For example, how will temperature affect a bed in the same ecosystem? Okay, same ecosystem. Interactions in an ecosystem result in the flow of energy through biotic and abiotic factors or components within that ecosystem. The energy flow is given back to abiotic components when the biotic factors fade off or they die. Plant and algae absorb the essential vitamins and minerals they need to live in their environment. And animals eat plants and algae and also they absorb vitamins and minerals from these Predators eat other animals, and the, or predators eat other animals and obtain energy and nutrients from them. This is how the abiotic and biotic factors are able to live well within an ecosystem. Living things in an ecosystem are in, in interdependent, so it means that they depend on each other. One depends on the other, just like that, for their own survival, for their own well-being, and for their own lives. This means that living organisms depend on both biotic, like the biotic actually, depend on the abiotic factors for survival. A typical example is a tree depends on sunlight to be able to prepare food, to get the nourishment it requires, so that herbivores will feed on the plant, carnivores will feed on the herbivores, and then if the presence, the presence of omnivores, they will also feed on the carnivores. Now, these are my questions that I've displayed on your screens for you. Number one. How different is the biotic component of an ecosystem from the abiotic component? You have biotic component. How is it different from a biotic component? Number two, let's we each for biotic and abiotic components of the ecosystem. So, what are biotic components? That's what I'm asking for the one. Number two, give me examples of biotic and abiotic components. Three here, three there. Three. 
Name the ecosystems we have. How many are they? The main one, how many are they? Number four, what are the reasons behind different living organisms in different ecosystems? Why is it that different living organisms live in different ecosystems? We don't have the same organisms in different ecosystems, but different ones live in different areas. Fortunately or unfortunately, that is bringing us to the end of today's lesson on the last section of ecosystem. So the ecosystem has been dealt with. And I believe that there's a last part that we have to also talk about that we'll do. So I come to your homes next time, I'm always a science facilitator of Kunyako. And bye-bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.